Welcome to the Venue RX podcast, where we provide a prescription of tips, tools, hacks, and interviews to improve your wedding venue. If you are looking to start, improve, or maximize your wedding venue, this is the place for you. Make sure to subscribe and follow along wherever you listen to podcasts as we delve into the wild world of weddings. We hope you get a lot of value from this episode. And now we'd like to introduce our hosts, Tim Wyrick and Jonathan Amon. All right. Good morning, everyone, or good evening or good afternoon or wherever, whatever time of the day you are joining us here on the Venue RX podcast. We are so excited to be joining you. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I am one of the hosts here along with our other host, Tim Wyrick. Tim, how are you? What's up? I'm doing great. How are you, Jonathan? I am doing good. You know, I am so excited about not only today's episode, but the fact that this is podcast number two, episode two. number two for us. Two. And yeah. everyone I'm going to be more and more excited about because I, I think that this podcast has the potential to really, really provide a lot of value to people. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of fun creating it and I'm, I'm really just excited to see where it goes, not only how it impacts both of our businesses, but how it can impact other people's businesses as well. So we've got a great show lined up for everyone today. Uh, I would encourage you, we are recording this in video format too. So if you are driving in the car right now, or uh, if you're listening to this at work, you know, when you're at your venue, um, think about checking us out on YouTube as well, because this is here, you get to see Tim's handsome face and uh, you know, um, you get to interact with us in a little bit of a different way. So we love interaction, those comments, uh, the input that, that you guys have as far as topics that we cover and things that are important to you that we would love to talk about are, are very important to us. So go ahead and consider subscribing to us on YouTube and of course, follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Do we have any housekeeping to do today, Tim? I don't, I think? I don't know, except that you're, you're up in the hot seat today. So I'm, I'm super excited about this. Um, and by the way, you crushed that intro yet again. So you're two for two. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cool. keep, I got a little tally here going just to make sure. <laughs> all right. All right. I like it. Well, no, no housekeeping. Eventually we'll be announcing sponsors and we'll have all sorts of fun things for you all. But, um, we have a great show today and Tim's right. I am in the hot seat. We are pinging back and forth between Tim and I just talking about a bit of our experience, a bit of our story, which I'm excited to kind of slowly reveal as we get through this, this uh, podcast. But yes, today I'm in the hot seat and I'm, I'm excited. I've really I never had someone ask me questions or interview me in a sense. And I don't know exactly the format of what you're going to, what you're going to ask me right now, but I'm, I'm prepared. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to ask you either. I'm just going to sit here and, and talk because that's, that's no, no, no. Obviously we have um, a, a great, great uh, episode today. Today we get to talk about venue pricing and um, you know, obviously before we get too deep into it, um, you know, who the hell are you, Jonathan? And why should we listen to what you're saying? And, you know, uh, I, I know a little bit of your background and um, I want to kind of hear where you came from just a little bit and then kind of how you, why you're, um, I guess, a, an expert on this, on this particular subject in this particular realm. Well, where I came from, let's see my <laughs> mom and dad. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so where I came from, I was originally born in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Texan, born and raised raised on a farm 15, 15 years or so. And then we moved to California because of my dad's job. And my family is uh, super focused, I would say on, on customer service. And I know that sounds kind of random, like, you know, all families kind of have their thing, but <laughs> you know, for our family to be focused on customer service is less of customer service, but uh, it's more of a focus on how things are done you know, not just what is being done. And that comes from my grandmother and, and my family and I'm Italian and Arab. And um, my, my grandmother really passed that along to my mom, that focus on customer service and kind of going the extra mile consistently. You know, you don't just do the dishes, you do the dishes, make sure the water is super hot and you're washing them with soap and, you know, they're dried and there's no water spots when you're done with it. And, you know, kind of just like going that extra mile. And so yeah, from a very true. early age, the, the kind of doing things excellently was ingrained in me and, um, fast forward, I'm going to just fast forward through my story. I ended up working a bunch of different restaurant jobs. And in addition to that, I, I just got married, uh, just had my son and my oldest son who's seven now. And I picked up shifts with a catering company. 
and I would pick up shifts occasionally with my wife and I would see repeatedly that whenever that catering company would hire staff, they consistently underperformed. They were expensive based on what the, the catering owner was expressing to me. <laughs> and I just felt like, wow, this is an incredible opportunity. You know, this is, this is a market that's clearly being underserved. And I live here in the Southern California area. And I was like, wow, what, what an area to underserve, right? For, yeah, right. for an entire industry. And so um, I began a small staffing company. First, it was just friends and family. And then we continued to add on staff, add on services that we provided, specifically focusing on uh, caters and event producers, venues, providing food and beverage, uh, hospitality staffing. So servers, bartenders, um, registration folks, a little bit of promotional people, um, really kind of stayed away from back of house chefs, things like that, and stayed away from kind of the more of the promotional model street team type stuff. Although we did end up doing that a little bit later, but really hyper-focused on food and beverage staffing. Okay. So <clears throat> awesome. That's, that's a lot. That was a very short condensed timeline for the last, what, how old are you now? Like a hundred, no, 27, 26, I think is what we're going with today. Um, no, seriously though, uh, your, your, your family, is it, are you, is your family consistent of, uh, are consisted of a bunch of entrepreneurs or are you the only entrepreneurial one or, or tell us a little bit about that. Like how did that come about? So my family, my extended family definitely has their entrepreneurial tendencies. My mother is extremely uh, entrepreneurial. Okay. Um, definitely a visionary has a ton of ideas, uh, awesome. is very creative. And, uh, my dad on the other hand is, you know, your very, very typical classic career guy super steady, super, um, you know, got his degree, got several degrees. I think he has like five or six degrees now. Wow. Um, yeah. super good at school, just wonderful employees, worked at two or three companies his whole, whole life. So I definitely didn't get any of the entrepreneurial stuff from him, but he did instill a lot of stuff in me, uh, you know, just about hard work and consistency. And so those kind of two things are, are the influences that have been in my life. Best of the both worlds, I think. I think that's uh, you know the consistent paycheck, but the entrepreneurial drive to make it even better. I think that's that's awesome. I can definitely see that coming through in, in what you guys have done. Um, kind of jumping forward to the staffing company. So it sounds like you were focused more on the front end kind of component of the staffing, not really the back end, but um, more of like the the customer facing um, and the interactions between the back of the house and the front of the house, and then the customers. Is is that right? Totally right. We're really obsessed with the guest. And that even goes past our clients because in most cases, our clients would be, uh, we would be a subcontractor, right? You know, our clients would be the caterers who were serving the guest. And our whole philosophy on that is, you know, if we can wow and really impress and delight the guests that are maybe not our specific clients, but, mm -hmm. you know, they are the clients, they're the guests of our client, then, you know, our, our client will really like us. The catering company will really like us. And so we, we've just been really hyper-focused on making incredible experiences for those guests that we've been able to interact with. Awesome. So how did you go from staffing? And, and I want to talk about that just, just a hair more, you know, um, give me some relevance and some substance on what kind of staffing company, how big were you, how small were you? Obviously this is kind of like COVID impacted everybody. So like pre COVID, what, what were you really focused on and what areas and what realms and how did you, I guess, transition into weddings? Definitely. Well, I mean, weddings were our bread and butter and pretty much what we started on initially when it was just me working with a local catering company here uh, in the area. And they were wonderful. I, ha I have to give them a shout out here, Amiho Experience. Uh, Kevin, Juan, if you guys are listening to this, uh, thank you. They allowed me, I, I say allowed, they I think really encouraged me to make the transition between just working for them and helping manage a little bit of their team and bringing folks onto the team to actually saying, all right, guys, I'm going to double our prices to build in a, a profit margin, right. <laughs> you know, and we're going to still provide this service for you. And, you know, they were our first client and they shared our name with other people. I think they were satisfied with our services. And so we, you know, my family, my wife's family has uh, eight people in it. I have four. So that was 12 staff right there. And, <laughs> you know, that's, that's really where we started. And then, you know, awesome. friends of those people, classmates, whatever, um, you know, we started this when we were in college. And so it was that grassroots effort that really got us started. And ending 2019 pre-COVID, 
we had a little over 600 staff that we were working with. Uh, right. On a varied basis, whether they were contractors, W-2 employees, um, we had several different types of employment structures, depending on the project, depending yep. on you yep. know the relationship there. But um, yeah, we were able to serve super large events, you know, Comic Con, Stagecoach, Coachella, um, influencer parties, all sorts of things. Work in the homes of billionaires, and then also do really small backyard stuff. You know, where there's 10, yeah. 12 people and, you know, you're helping do their dishes and take out the trash at the end of the night. So the Dude, dichotomy is really cool. That, that's awesome. And, and just to that point, like some of the experiences you get from going to those events and the people like the excitement in general, and like, that's, that's so awesome. And then, I mean, that's a, an astounding number, 600. That's, that's so many people. And, um, I, I think that that's just absolutely amazing. And so from start to, you know, I guess the peak we can call it for now, what, what timeline were we looking at there? So we started off as a sole proprietorship and then quickly we found out we got slapped with a a hefty tax bill. I think our love those taxes like, yeah, year in or something like that. And we're like, Oh man, you know, we need to consider incorporating. So we incorporated and that was in my goodness. Um, we incorporated in 2017. Okay. But it was 15. It was 15 when we started. I apologize. It was 14 when we started. So it was the end of 14, 15. Yeah. Okay. It was when we actually started the company. So about five, five, six years, depending on how, how you're counting it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so one of the things you said, and, and I think that's going to be a good segue into our subject, um, is, is you had to incorporate varying pricing structures and models to accommodate different events, different people, different employees. Um, so I, I definitely think that's fantastic. And, and that's why I really am excited to talk to you about this particular subject today. Um, before we do that, what is it that you're doing now? And how, how did you transition from uh, the staffing company into what you're doing today, which is, well, you're still doing that, but at the same time, uh, venue management, which I think is very relevant to our. Definitely. Business. Definitely. So we, uh, we went through a, a little bit of a process. We had two different companies, two different competitors, uh, consider acquiring us and conversations, um, are, are, um, I think continuing to evolve. We really were excited about, staffing. We love what we do working with our team, but you know, it is centered on the uh, Southern California area and we really want to grow outside of that. And so, you know, as we considered that taking on, um, more people, regional managers, things like that, you know, it was, the question was, do we really want to do this or do we want to expand into other areas? And at that time in 2018, we had recently started working with a large uh, winery and a, a very large property, uh, out here in the San Diego area. And it's a 23,000 acre ranch. So just huge, especially for California. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's massive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess it's large for anywhere, but cer- certainly <laughs> in California. Um, so we were doing that really, really enjoyed it, started booking weddings and, you know, we, we thought this is, this is what we want to do. So we segued into not just doing the staffing, uh, at all of the different locations that we would work at. But then at that point we kind of had a little bit of our own location. Mm -hmm. So that was the segue there. And one of the things that we noticed was oftentimes as the staff who came into a foreign environment, often, you know, working at any different wedding venues, any of the different wedding venues that we worked at in San Diego, um, the success or failure of the event often hinged on the venue, how the venue was set up or how the coordinator, the job that the coordinator did and structuring everything, making sure timelines were there, enough time was built in for a flip or things like that. And so, you know, we felt our our goal has been to always make an impact and to serve the guests that we we can the best way we can. And so what better way to make that impact than start getting involved on the, on the venue side. And so uh, most recently in the flip with COVID we're still, you know, I would say tentatively (laughs) staffing, you know, as, as things come up and I've definitely seen a shift towards um, events starting to pick back up, which is very exciting. And we can talk about that in in other episodes, but One of the things that we've been extremely excited about is about four months ago, we started working with a, an additional venue. And as we continue to add to the venues we work with, um, this venue has been incredible because we've been able to be involved building it from the ground yeah. up. And so that's where, that's where some of you know, our conversations have come from and some of my passion for what we're doing here. Just we've been on this ride of 
creating a venue, pricing the venue out, literally building it, you know, working yep. with the contractors. And so, um, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's, I, like I, that. I, I think I got off, I got off, got excited. That was perfect. That was, that was perfect. Yeah. It's segued right into it. So pricing when, when you're, you're, you've got two venues that you're managing, um, obviously with my experience and in, in the different locations, um, pricing is one of the subjects that just comes up over and over and over again. And we can all agree there's at least a million variables that impact your pricing. Um, but you know, I, I kind of want to start with what, what do you think are, you know, the top one, two or three things you need to take into consideration when determining what you're going to charge your clients. Um, and, and then I've got several follow-up questions depending on how that goes, but can you, can you name one, two or three things where you're like, you know, I'm, this is a 23,000 acres. I'm going to charge a buck an acre. So it's $23,000 for a wedding. Like how, how did you do the mental math? And, and hopefully there's a little more science behind it than just that. But, um, can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So with both venues, um, I have a couple things that I like to do. The first one is, and Tim, I know you'll say this a number of different <laughs> times, just get started, right? Yeah. Find a number that, you know that you can sell a wedding at. So even if that's a lower number, and I generally like starting a little bit lower to kind of see how the market reacts to that. Now, with that said, I think there's a lot of different ways to build in value, but you don't know what value is and you don't know, you know, what you really should be charging without doing research on your market and without understanding what other venues are charging. And more importantly, what clients, what guests, what brides and grooms, what couples are looking for. And so, you know, what, what is the big difference? Are they looking for an amazing photo op? Are they looking for someone place that has on-site accommodations? Are they looking for someone most recently here with an outdoor space, right? What is the big draw? Why are people booking certain venues? Is it that it's a, you know, a blank canvas venue? Is it everything's, it's all inclusive. Um, what, what is the draw and then building your packages based off of that and kind of understanding where your market is. And so some, you know, here in San Diego, um, you know, you look on any of the main sites, the not wedding wire or whatever, and you'll see different statistics, you know, average, average wedding venue cost is $6,000 or, you know, 14,000 when you factor in food and you know, whatever the, you know, yep. there are some of those numbers floating around, but I think it's really important to understand your property and understand what is different about your property and why you can charge more or why maybe you should charge more for what you're offering. And again, that just know that just requires knowing your market. And so for us, for both properties to kind of directly answer your question, those are a couple, couple things there. I kind of leave yeah. it all together <laughs> um, to directly answer your question. We, for the one property, we started around the $4,000 range for just the venue, bare bones, no rentals at all. Okay. And what we quickly found, and that was our first venue. I mean, we're just complete newbies at this. What we found very quickly was there were things that people wanted options on. And everyone thinks, I think everyone thinks they want more options than they actually want. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> they want the feeling of freedom. I think is, is really what, what people are looking for. And they want to make that customized experience for their guests and for their family. And they're investing a chunk of money. You know, this is going to be one of the most sizable purchases that they've made maybe ever up until that point. And so, um, you know, making sure that the venue price, uh, reflects the value that you're bringing for us meant that we needed rentals you know, at least tables and chairs. And we found that by doing that, we could actually charge more. So, you know, we raised the price to around 6,000 with a bare bones setup. Um, and we played around with that pricing and we had a target. We wanted to get to around $10,000, but there were different things that we started to offer to see on the property. There's a helicopter pad that we developed there on that property. Um, yeah, bridal and groom suites, different things like that. And as we started to add those on, the price continued to increase just based on what we saw in the area was happening at other wineries. So you're like, wait a minute, we're, we're going to charge you $12,000 because we have a helipad. So if you guys want to fly in, that's, that's essentially where you're coming out, right? <laughs> exactly. And I actually, so we did a tour. Of course, I had to like test out. Yeah. yeah right? I mean, obviously. And Does it come was, with the helicopter is my question. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, it was, it was an outside vendor, but it was, it was really cool. There's like this sprinkler that pops up in the middle of the area and completely wets 
Oh, all so of the dust gravel. doesn't fly everywhere yeah. or it scares off all the people. Like if you're standing here, get the hell out. Cause you're going to get wet and land. Up Both <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Safety. Yep. Um, uh, that was awesome. So, um, you said a whole lot, so I'd like to just kind of unpack it, but it sounds like the three things that you want to really want to take into consideration are, um, number one, your market, kind of what, what everybody else is charging versus what you think you can get away with. Absolutely. Um, two, like what your unique identifier is, you know, what, what's unique about your venue that, um, people are willing to pay to come get married at your space as opposed to, you know, everybody's got four walls and a roof and, you know, a floor, hopefully in most circumstances, um, unless you're an outdoor venue, then you have no roof or walls. Well, then you uh, have an oak, you know, then you have an oak tree or a stream. Well, or, yeah. You know, and there's one of, and even in your case, one of your venues is, is walls, no roof. So it's, it's an outdoor venue, but you've got the, the privacy, which I think is huge. Um, and then the last thing is, is kind of like, not necessarily the last thing, but one of the top three is the value that you're adding to your venue. So are you doing rentals? Are you offering catering? Are you offering alcohol? Like what are the extra amenities or the values that couples are looking for? Is, did I say that kind of? Yeah, no, right. you totally did. You to- yeah, that was that was a spot on. That was a spot on uh, summary. I, I think it's. I think the most important one that I've seen overall is just you have to understand your market. Yeah. You have to understand why people are coming to the area to get married, or why the people in the area are choosing you know wedding venues. And there are for sure trends. There are for sure things that specifically people are looking for, and so you'll be able to increase your price. You know, the goal is to run a profitable business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the focuses that we have here on this podcast, but you, to be able to do that, you have to understand what people are willing to pay for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just to kind of piggyback on that, um, in combination with, you know, how much does it cost you to run the venue? So there's obviously a lot more science and data that gets ball, you know, behind it. Um, but one of the things that really, you said that I think a lot of venue owners take for granted is the couple, the client that you're bringing into your venue, they have this entire wedding to pay for, not just your wedding venue. So while you do want to maximize your profitability and what you can charge, you have to realize that whatever they pay you, that eats away from their entire wedding budget. So if you're charging 10 grand for your venue and they only have a $30,000 budget, you just took a third of their budget, which is actually on par with statistics. Um, but that's that's something to take into consideration because there's there's a term out there, it's called being venue poor. You got the most beautiful venue in the world, but you you have to serve hot dogs and, and you're you know playing a, an iPod for a DJ. So it's like, some of those things I think you want to take into consideration. Um, and you had just said that like it's, it's an experience for your guests and you, you really have to think about those things as you, you start to price out your, your venue. So um, one of the things you said is you started low and, and I think I, I definitely agree with that as you are new and you're getting entered into the market and you're testing it and just getting started. Um, you know, what was your math, your science behind saying, okay, 4,000 wasn't enough we're going to charge 5,000 or 6,000. Was there a plan or was it just, Hey, we talked to this person. I feel like they have a little more money. They're carrying a Gucci purse. Like what was your kind of logic <laughs> behind it? Just arbitrary price. Yeah, right. you know? <laughs> Someone pulls up in a Range Rover. You're like, mm, all right, this is going to be a solid $8,000 rental right here. No, 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 no. It was, it was definitely more planned out. Uh, $4,000 we felt like to your, your uh, 30% rule, I guess that, that you kind of said, we were looking to target weddings that were spending around fifteen to twenty thousand okay. dollars, and you know we felt like we could capture a large segment of the market that that was a very attainable goal, and the people that were going to be renting the space out from us uh, it's a little bit further out, uh, kind of out towards Ramona, and so you know they were going to have to get their guests there, they were going to have to figure out lodging, there were some different things that were going to be increased costs for them potential transportation costs, even for wedding guests, you know, uh, Ubers, Lyfts, whatever. And so we wanted to start it at a attractive enough price to build in a lot of extra room in their budget, like you said, for DJs, for florists, for coordinators, for videographers. And we wanted to do that with also the goal in mind of marketing. So the more content that we could create there, you know, the more budget flexibility and and budget that we opened up for them to bring some of those vendors in meant more, um, I I think word of mouth referral, uh, possibilities through, you know, Instagram, Facebook, and, and then just, you know, people actually 
being able to show up. And with a venue, you know, we've talked about in our first episode, building versus leasing. I really like, um, you know, building a venue from the, building a venue from the ground up uh, versus taking an existing building. I really like being able to make money from day one. And so to really kind of speed that process up, having those first weddings go out pretty cheaply allows you to kind of understand how people fill the space. So yeah, the $4,000, $4,000 number, I think that's, um, you know, you're not spending, you know, you're not charging 1200 bucks or something right. really, really cheap. It's a, it's a respectable amount of money. It'll definitely cover any costs that most reasonable venues will have, yep. uh, including a day of person security and things like that. Um, you know, you're not going to get rich by any means, but it's a good place to figure out your value and how people respond to that, to that amount. Yeah. And, and I totally agree. Um, you know, I always, my logic was it's a marketing expense. You know, if I charge 4,000, but I get 200 people to show up, I mean, that's 200 new eyes that are going to be seeing our, our venue for the first time. So, you know, if I wanted to be at the 8,000 or $9,000 range, um, it's just a $4,000 marketing expense. And that's for 200 eyeballs that are going to experience what your venue is. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's somewhat of a double edged sword because if you start low, it, it does become increasingly harder to increase your price, um, which I think you, you have to do it gradually. But because uh, the, the last thing I, I think you know is you don't want bride A to say, hey, you know, I paid 4000 for the venue and then bride B comes two weeks later and they're getting charged 6000 for the venue. It's like, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? So that conversation in the background can, can damage um, the reputation just a little bit. But from a venue well, perspective... Go ahead. And that's a, well, and that's a, great, that's a great point you make, Tim. Yeah. I think uh, one of the dangers, one of the things that we definitely felt the friction on is as we look to consistently increase the venue pricing, we're actually doing that right now on, on this property that we're working on right now. We're jumping $2,000 in price. Wow. It's a pretty substantial jump. And one of the ways that we can uh, rationalize it to people if we're having those conversations is to point to some of the different improvements that we're making mm-hmm. on the property. And so mm-hmm. I think that that when you're, when, both when you're building a venue or when you're taking an existing building and modifying it, you can say, hey, this year, you know, we didn't have bride, bridal or groom suites at all, you know, yeah. and now we're adding them. We just invested $100,000 into the property. You know, we're doing this, this, and this, and you can actually show them what you've done and say, you know, because of that, we've added substantial value. This has onsite accommodations now, or, you know, we've included package rentals in all of our, uh, packages or whatever. So this is why it's more expensive. And you can kind of show that when you're at a venue that's been around a little bit longer, albeit that's definitely a little bit trickier, but, uh, you know, it's definitely, you can definitely find other ways to build an extra cost or, or build an, uh, you know, a price increase, but I definitely find those newer venues. It's easier to make those price jumps because you're just in process. Well, and you have that tangible value add, something that they can taste and see and smell. It's just like, okay, yeah, I get two rooms. Um, and I think for you know existing venues, a two thousand dollars price jump is is going to be very, very hard to justify and explain. Um, but you know, two fifty, hundred fifty, five hundred dollars. I think you're 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 pushing a limit there that's approachable. Um, and don't forget, I mean, every year you've got a new set of clients coming in, so the the chances of a, a new client meeting an old client um, and exchanging price information, you know if it's a $500 swing, it's like, Oh, they're charging 5,500 instead of 5,000. Now, not that big a deal. Nobody's going to really throw their arms up in the air. Um, but the best way to do it, like you said, is, is to add value. Um, and, and I would stress, you know, try to add value that doesn't cost you a significant amount of money. Um, one of our strategies was, you know, a photo booth rental. If we could have a photo booth that was just standalone and operational and include it, you know, photo booths were going anywhere from 1500 to 2000 at the time we did this. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like we can add a photo booth for 750 bucks and everybody's like, no brainer. Um, didn't cost us any money, but it allowed us to increase the price of the venue. So I think there's a lot of strategies people can use when it comes to pricing. Um, and, and the one you just said, like this again, comes back to the value, the value of what you're providing, um, on top of the venue rental. So, um, well, and I think one of the other things that people need to remember about pricing when they're considering venues specifically in our industry is that you often don't have repeat clients, right? Right. right. You know, you, hopefully you don't hopefully, have repeat hopefully. Yeah. yeah. We're not in the business for repeat business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, and that is both a unique disadvantage and an advantage because, you know, yes, you are working with those vendors, but you know, who, who may be repeat 
uh, vendors that are working on your property, but your client, you know, client A uh, will not be the same client for next year. And so you're not going to have to rationalize to them. Oh, this year it was 2000. This next year it's 4,000 or this, this year it's 6,000 next year. It's 12,000. You can almost make those jumps to your point and you're going to have a fresh set of uh, clients who are walking through those doors. And yeah, I mean, they, they're not going to see, there's no history of pricing on (laughs) wedding wire or the (laughs) knot or Facebook or wherever else people are looking at pricing. Well, and I mean, that, that's a perfect segue is, is once you figure out your pricing, do you list it on your website? Do you just do it during the tours or, or whatever you call the engagement, the first interaction with the clients when they're coming to see your venue? Like what, what is it? Where do you show your pricing? Where do you list it? If you do, um, can you answer that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I like for both venues, that at this point I've priced out and I've operated. And I think even moving forward, I like having the pricing included in a brochure that goes out after we have a touch point with a client. Uh, I think that's important for a couple of different reasons. First, I want to be able to control and switch things around. And since all the projects that we've been on have been consistently evolving, in fact, the ranch property that we are working with right now, they're building an entirely new venue on the property. You know, so there are things that are changing there. Liquor licenses are being added, like different things are happening to increase that value. So if people are hanging, if people are looking at a website, you know, and they're seeing it change, that's something that they're looking at in the comfort of their home. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the brochure is the same way, but then we have the conversation that started and then we get to send that brochure to them, uh, in the auspices of a conversation about a possible booking. Right. So I like, I like, um, I like having it on our brochure and being able to control that. But of course on, you know, wedding wire the knot, there are different budget tools. So I, one of the things that I think we need to do a better job at is understanding what do average weddings cost at our property. And Tim, you and I have actually talked about this before. (laughs) People come in and they ask the question, if you're a venue owner right now, you know what I'm talking about or a venue manager, people come in and say generally, and I think it's especially the guys. I don't Well, yeah, the budget because everyone's paying for it. No, I'm just kidding. Like, yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, but it's true. You know, oh, generally on average, it'll kind of be like maybe even, I don't want to say an awkward question, but kind of just something that comes out on their way out. They're like, well, yeah. and just, just so I know, how much are people spending on average here? And I think that's a really important number to know and have that dialed in, especially when you're a blank canvas venue, because people need to know, you know, sure, your venue rental might be six or eight or $10,000. But what else do they have to spend to get it to be a really, you know, wonderful experience? And so dialing that in, I think is something that we need to do a better job at. And I would encourage anyone out there listening to just have that number at the top of their head, right at their fingertips so they can provide that to the clients because very quickly the discussion might change and you don't want to waste that couple's time. And at the same time, you don't want to waste your time, um, you know, with, with a couple when they are not your couple, they are not your right fit for the venue and it may not be what they're looking for. Yeah, no, and I think that's uh, uh, fantastic is you don't wanna scare them away um, at the same time. Uh, you wanna give them the accurate representation because the last thing you want is to get them in there. Yeah, I got them, I got them, but they only have you know $15,000 budget and then the wedding doesn't go as they planned. The, the challenge, and you said this a couple minutes ago, is the venue is the one that usually gets blamed if there's anything wrong. So even if you don't provide catering and the caterer come came in and screwed up, like the venue is the one that's going to take the brunt of the bad review. Um, and so being transparent and, and explaining to people, you know, even if it is a $50,000 average budget that comes through here, you know, you can explain like the, we just have some couples that come in here and just do everything and go very extravagant, but we've also had weddings in here from, you know, $15,000. So, um, you have the flexibility to do what you want to do there. Uh, but you're right. Have that number that is most consistent, um, set the right expectation at the very beginning because the last thing you want is, is to set an expectation that you can't you know, achieve or exceed and then have that come back on you in the end. Um, and that's, that's really the best thing and worst thing about venues is you're at the front of the, the education. Like you're, you're getting people that don't have any idea what weddings cost or what venues cost. So venue owners, if you're listening, you, you've got one of the toughest jobs, but one of the best jobs to be able to guide them and, and explain to them why and how and so that when they go to the next one, you're the trusted source. 
So. Absolutely. And that's, that's to, to your point and to this whole topic of pricing, you know, I feel like we can go back to the, uh, you know, well-used, shall we say, <laughs> story about coffee, right? And Starbucks, like why pay four yeah. five, six bucks, seven bucks in some cases, you know, for a fancy coffee concoction when you could go to 7-Eleven or a McDonald's or something like that and get, you know, a dollar, two dollar cup of coffee. And it's the education. It's how they're framing it. It's the, the, it's the framing. It's totally yeah. the framing. And so you're right. Being the venue, being one of the first stops that couples will make, we have that unique opportunity to help define their experience. And even if you are one stop along that couple's way of, you know, visiting six or seven venues. And even if your venue doesn't get, um, booked, you have that opportunity to kind of set the, the stage for them and be radically unique or, you know, be very similar or, you know, whatever, whatever style that you have, uh, you have that opportunity as, like I said, one of the first stops that couples make. Oh, absolutely. Um, Tim, I had had a question though. I had a question for you because, because, you know, you've, you have been involved in building at this point, more venues than I have. When you looked at pricing for your venues, I want to ask that question back to you strictly for the viewers or listeners, because I think that your experience is invaluable. When you were doing, uh, venues in different markets, what was your go-to strategy for defining venue pricing? Was it looking at the competition because you had venues in different places all throughout the U S. So what, what kind of went into your process on, on doing that? I I had a little more kind of data science behind what we were doing. Um, my model when I first started was if we can, if we can charge enough on Saturdays to cover our overhead, then we will consider ourselves successful because the chances of you booking a Friday and Sunday and Thursday increase over time. Um, and that becomes your gravy. So our, our math was, you know, what, what is our yearly cost, um, from staffing to rent to utilities and and kind of budgeted all that out. Um, and then within that market, making sure that some of our competition was able to charge what we needed to charge, but we, we would strictly use Saturdays. and, And that's where it's like, if I book 50 Saturdays a year, because chances are, Thanksgiving and Christmas are our bust for weddings. Um, I, w- I would take, you know, if we have a million dollars in expenses, I would take a million divided by 50 and say, okay, we have to book 50 weddings at X number of dollars to make sure that we covered our overhead. Um, now, if that number became too high, it's like we can't, we wouldn't target that market. It wasn't an exact science, but it was enough to get us, you know, at least to the next stage of, of considering the venue and, and, you know, doing more exploratory research, like, okay, what's our market charging for weddings? Are they charging 3000? Are they getting away with 8,000? The challenge I have with looking at your competition, call it competition, um, your your local venue market is that value add the the three things that they have to take into consideration. You know, how long have they been around? What values are they incorporating? And it's, it's very hard to get an apples to apples comparison when you're looking at venue to venue. Um, That's incredible. That's great advice. Yeah. As a venue owner, I mean, if you can do that, um, if you can give your clients and your prospective clients an apple to apple comparison of you and your six other venues that you get compared to most, that eases the, the mind of your customer. And when they go and explore those venues, like, oh, well, they know I'm already going to see these three venues. And here it is like a, a straight chart of, you know, this is what we offer this is what they offer. This is the pricing and, and this is where we go. I wouldn't put pricing on there because you don't know what anybody else is going to charge. You don't want to put them in that hole. But, you know, as long as you're taking the information that's been shared publicly, you know, uh, they charge 25 bucks a person for catering. This one doesn't offer catering. This one's, you know, 30 bucks for alcohol. We don't charge for alcohol. Like whatever that, that grid is. Um, I think that really helps clients and will help you better understand your market and your venue. So, um, that, that's where we would start to just initially do the math of 50 Saturdays, does that cover all of your overhead? Um, and, and then go from there. And that's kind of what we used. And then we would try to push that number up over time. Uh, so we, we would start half uh, of what we thought we could get away with um, very beginning to get some bodies in there. Uh, and, and then from there, I would, I would say, okay, we booked 10 weddings at this price. Let's bump it up 500. And we booked five weddings at that price. Let's bump it up another 500. Um, and if you do that at the very beginning, 
you, you have less conflict, potential conflict down the road of the different pricing wars where, hey, this bride A paid this much and bride B paid this much because it's- Did you see that happening? Say what? Did you see that happening a lot? No, because what we did was, like I said, we did it at the beginning. So, you know, the first 10 people and uh, it was $4,000 and the next 10 people it was $4,500. The chances of those, you know, 20 people knowing or interacting were, were pretty slim. Um, but by the time we got to the 50th person, it was, oh, okay, that's our standard price. And, and then everybody, you know, just kind of expected that. Um, and then year over year, I wanted to obviously make a little more and with margins and numbers and what is it, inflation, um, you know, tried to bump it up 250 to 500 a year. So, and that's, that's kind of the strategy that I used. And, and it's always been my math is back of the napkin math is 50 Saturdays covers our overhead. And if you know those numbers, you're, you're going to be in a typically a pretty safe zone. I have two and that would see, we're flipping the, the roles yeah. here, but All I have, right. two, All right. here we go. I have two questions <laughs> on this. I'm taking notes because this is incredible. So my first question is which expense did you feel like was the easiest to manipulate? So you mentioned staffing, you mentioned uh, utilities, uh, you mentioned whatever your rent was. Um, so whether that's a note on a loan that you use to help build the building yeah. or whether that's a, uh, an actual lease that you have, um, which of those expenses were the easiest to fluctuate? Because you, you can obviously make more money by driving down expenses or increasing, yeah. uh, your price. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, you're, this is a big can of worms and I think it's gonna, this is gonna be a lot of opportunity for more episodes. Um, Staffing was one of the ones that we controlled right from the beginning. So we ran, or I run a very lean model. Um, you know, three people should be able to host about 150 weddings a year. Um, and, and there gets to be a point where you need to increase your staff because you don't want them to be overworked and exhausted. Um, but at the same time, in the hospitality industry, you know that just because you're working Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you usually get Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off um, mm -hmm. before you kind of have to jump back in. So there, there's that balance there. Um, the, the lease and the building expenses, you know, those are pretty static. Um, but those are the numbers you can play with at the very beginning with, with you know, negotiating your lease and talking to the landlord, um, the different build outs and TIs. So you have some control there. Um, so, you know, start with the market where you're in, figure out kind of where everybody's at, figure out what your potential cost and what you can, um, you know, incur with, with your Saturday rates and then build that into your model and then go to the, the landlord and say, hey, you know, I can only pay $10,000 a month. And so if we can get close to that number, let's have a conversation. Um, if not, then, you know, I need to move on. And honestly, a lot of landlords, especially right now, um, are open to these conversations a little more than they were uh, just because of COVID. So there's an opportunity there to come in and say, hey, you know, I'm willing to do a five-year lease and, and take this risk um, if you're willing to give me a rate that, you know, mitigates my risk to a certain extent. Absolutely. Um, Utilities are unique because, you know, if you're wanting a, a wedding venue, most of your utilities are used at the off-peak hours. So in California, you have your on-peak and off-peak hours where electricity actually costs you way more between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Well, we weren't using electricity in that time frame because we had daylight. So we didn't turn on the HVAC until 4 p.m. or 3 p.m., you know, a couple hours before the guests arrived. And that's when, you know, we were getting a better, more efficient energy costs running our venue in the evenings. So, um, that, that's again, pretty fixed. Um, but once you break it down, it's, you know, this event costs us a pro So our yearly utility bill was call it $25,000 and we did a hundred weddings. So we have $250 per wedding that goes towards our utilities. So we put that into our costs. Um, you know, then staffing, we have call it half a million dollars a year in staffing and we did 200 events. So, you know, you, you just kind of build, you do the math backwards um, to get to that cost and, and really determine, okay, if we can cut down our staffing here or do we need to increase staffing to get more weddings? It's, it's a fun, constant game that's ever changing. Uh, but I think that's where you, you have a lot more ability to control the cost at the beginning of the venue launching as opposed to when you're mid-range, you know, mm -hmm. mid well, We're going to have to have another podcast specifically on, I think, staffing yeah. Um, and the staff that goes into a wedding venue, because I think we're talking about two different scenarios here. And if you're listening from a venue that does, it is more all inclusive, you probably have a lot yeah. heavier of a staff load than if you're talking a strictly 
blank canvas. And then even in the blank canvas world, there are degrees of variation between having, you know, the three people that you mentioned between having a flip team and, yep. you know, other people to come in and, and help. So, um, definitely something, something that we're going to have to follow up on. So if you're listening, well, that's, like you said, the value, when you add value, there are costs that come with that value. If you're adding rentals, you know, you, you have to pay somebody to set up those chairs and tables. And so you just think through the whole thing before you just say, well, we're just going to include tables and chairs because there, there are hidden costs that you're not even aware of, you know, cleaning and repairing and maintenance and storing. Like there's, there's so many things that come into it. And you know, you and I are going to talk about that in another episode, I'm sure. But, um, just be cognizant that there's, there's hidden costs in everything. Um, and there's a lot of profit to be made in different aspects and components. But when it comes to staffing, you're right. It's, it's, it's a, it's a beast. And I think it's going to be a whole another episode on, on the pros and Easily. cons of both. Easily. And I can't, I can't wait for that one. Um, so uh, my other question, I had, had two questions, but the other question was about peak pricing. So certain yeah. venues will charge more ven- more money for a certain time of year, yeah. right? Here in California, you know, we'll have uh, 80 or 90 degree Decembers. <laughs> so, you know, no one understands weather here. Um, it sprinkles and everyone's driving like a maniac on the road. Uh, but what's your, your theory on that or your kind of method? Do you believe in having peak pricing versus off peak pricing? Do you like one static price year round? What's your thought on that? Uh, I, I think that comes down to your personality and, and your market. Um, you know, I, I like simplicity. So I, I just like to charge by the day of the week. You know, if a Saturday costs this much, whether it's the day after Thanksgiving or it's New Year's Day. Um, and, and that's not entirely true. On, on holidays, we, I always wanted to charge a little more because I had to feel like I needed to compensate my staff for coming in on Absolutely. New Year's Day. Yep. Um, so there, there were those, that's the kind of peak pricing that I always incorporated. Um, but you know, when you look at different markets, each one will yield a different requirement. And so if you can't literally get married in Canada because roads are shut down and everything from, you know, November to April, whatever that season is, you're, you're going to have to compensate with your pricing at some point. So um, whether you're just shut down in that time frame, or yeah, you can come get married here. If you can get here flying on the helicopter, cause we have a helipad, you know, those sorts of situations and, and boom, you've got a wedding for 500 bucks. We'll just give you the venue for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think there's a right or a wrong here. Uh, I just like the simplicity and being able to say, well, what day do you want to get married on? Well, I want to get married on a Saturday. Boom venue costs this much. Well, what about in spring? Nope. Cost that much. What about winter? Nope. Cost that much. Just, it, it was very simple. Um, and, and that, that was my approach when it came to it. And maybe especially if you have both indoor outdoor spaces, depending on the venue, yeah. you might only have an outdoor space and you might be really constrained to, you know, the seasonality of your region versus if you have something, um, you know, like in like, Palm Springs, for example, you know, there's a whole season where literally the entire city shuts down right during, during that summer area. So, um, yeah. Okay, well, great. Well, yeah. And, and that, what you just said is perfect because my back of the napkin math was 50 Saturdays, but if you don't have 50 Saturdays, like your pricing model is going to change. If you can only do 30 Saturdays. Um, and, and again, that peak pricing throws that back in the napkin math off too. So if you're charging more for this quarter versus the next quarter, um, that that's going to distort the numbers just a little bit. So something to take into consideration there. Totally. All right. Is it my turn again? I think it's your turn. I'm so okay. sorry. I'm going to hand the Look, mic. No, the man, I, mic I, I, this here. is a dialogue. I, I like having these conversations. So, um, the, the last one that I kind of had to, to wind this down a little bit is what, what methods, payment plans do you offer your, your clients and your customers? And how did you kind of come up with those? That is a wonderful question and we're still in process of, okay. of talking about that because I, I want to do, I think because COVID has impacted the wedding industry, um, but the hospitality industry certainly, but private events in such a unique and impactful way, there's a lot of room right now to be extremely creative with how we help our couples finance a wedding. And even if it's something that's in the future, many people have lost jobs been laid off, but simultaneously, many people have got new jobs, you know, yep. are working in different careers that they, they weren't before. And so, um, the conversation about financing and the payment plans, I think is, is really important to think about based on again, who your client is, you know, the weddings that are 
targeted more towards someone in a, you know, 10 to $15,000 price range, let's just say, are going to be slightly different. Those needs are going to be different than weddings that average out at 30 to $50,000. And in the research that I've done so far, giving people payment plans is, um, can definitely be helpful, but a lot of times, you know, they want to kind of get it paid for in, in yeah. some senses. So it's been a mixed bag for us. We're still working it out. What we're doing right now and, and what we have done is fluctuate between uh, 50% down as the deposit or 25% down. But what we've been doing right now, which is interesting, is we've been providing a 100% back, money back, deposit back guarantee which is insane. We're going to get That's like unheard of. messages, yeah. you know, like maybe hate mail. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, 100% deposit back guarantee and we're reducing the, the deposit to 25%. Based, so, based on what though? Like you're, you're, you know what? I just don't want to get married at this venue anymore. I want my money back or like that's, no, so that's strictly, a very bold. Strictly, yeah. Okay. Well, and, and it is, so it's strictly related to COVID. So a COVID cancellation Okay. and, and it would have to be where the bride groom, you know, actually gets COVID yeah. or, um, or a stay at home order rendered it impossible for us to provide services on that day. Fortunately, both properties, one property, uh, we we're going to have a little bit of a harder time. And so we did have to refund everyone um, the money there. And fortunately that property was making money in a number of different ways. Right. And so we weren't completely, it, it wasn't, we weren't relying exclusively on the wedding revenue, but this, this other property, you know, we are able to be open at sometimes that other venues aren't able to be open just because of how the, the ownership of the property is structured and how we are renting the property to people. It's definitely a gray line, but we are, um, we don't feel, we, we feel like COVID is an extremely scary thing in a lot of senses. There's a lot that is happening with people, not just emotionally, but you know, even if you don't think that it's a, a huge impact, it's something you have to consider for your guests and you're asking yeah. people to travel in and there's a lot, it's a very dynamic conversation. Um, but we, we want to give people the opportunity to, to use their judgment them to follow any local guidelines or ordinances and make decisions based on that, you know, yeah. with vendors that feel comfortable, uh, and with the appropriate safety measures in place. So in any, in any case to wrap all that up, um, we've been the COVID money back guarantee basically is just if we have to completely shut down. And, you know, I've heard so many horror stories of venues not giving deposits back. And sometimes you just can't, I mean, yeah. the wedding business is a cash flow business. Uh, the venues, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because sometimes you're using deposits here to fund, you know, yeah. improvements or whatever. And so it can be very tricky, but fortunately in these two instances, we are able to offer that. And so I think it's an incredible advantage. And Hey, if you're in Southern California and you're looking for a wedding venue, I got to shout, I got to shout out both, both my spots. Yeah. Um, do it. So yeah, river garden weddings and events in Vista and then the Rancho Guajito uh, wedding venue. It's out closer towards Ramona, actually like a mile or two away from uh, the wild animal park. Give us a, a spelling on that Rancho Guajito. Rancho Guajito, G U E J I T O. Um, and then River Garden Weddings and Events. So Rancho Guajito is actually inactive till probably mid 2021. Um, we had a bunch of weddings, 20 weddings scheduled kind of pre COVID by March. And then we had to go ahead and refund most of those. Uh, and then we have River Garden that is, you know, we're, we're still operational, which is, yeah. which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes. Everybody check out those venues. Uh, Jonathan has been an instrumental part in, in those becoming wedding venues and they just look absolutely fantastic on social media. Unfortunately, I have not been able to travel to California to experience them in person nor meet Jonathan in person, which is kind of mind blowing for as long as well, we've known each other. This is fun. This is, yeah. to, I mean, we're going to have, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 episodes under our belt and be fast friends and talk every day <laughs> and, then, and then we're going to meet. So this is going to, this is cool. Uh, no, dude, this, is, this has been a blast. Um, so to kind of wrap it up, um, I want to try something just a little bit different, uh, if that's okay. So we're, we're calling it the lightning round. Um, 
name TBD, but I think we were kind of sticking with it for now. So, um, what, what is one positive shift you've seen in the last year? This is a tough one right now, especially. Yeah, that is a tough one. Um, you know, I think this year has been a really emotional one for a lot of people specifically in this industry, but what I think that it has done for many people is provide clarity about, you know, how passionate they are about doing what they're doing, because there's definitely been a lot of pressure. There's definitely been a lot of, um, you know, just the environment that we've lived in uh, has been, has provided a lot of pressure towards, you know, people's careers, uh, finances, things like that. And so a positive shift that, that I have felt in my own life and in my own business is a focus back to the basics, you know, really, really streamlining what you're doing, streamlining your spending, um, getting a little bit tighter again, maybe in ways that I should have been prior. And it's very easy to run really loose and, and kind of fast when all the money's coming in and everything's great. But then when there's a little bit of a contraction, you know, whether that's an economic contraction, whether there's, you know, a pandemic like, like this one here, whether there is, um, whatever the adversity that is in your specific market. And this can be, this can vary based on the market, you know, trade wars, trade problems. You know, if you work with yep. a company that does overseas, those things, you really have to drill back down into the essentials and the basics of your business budget and just not make some of those choices that maybe you made that were frivolous expenses. And so for me, that's been a, a huge positive shift in, in the last year for me. Well, and you said it perfect. You didn't say your venue, you said your business. And I think that's something that you and I are very passionate about. Not only are we passionate about weddings and wedding venues, but the business of being in weddings and wedding venues. And I think that's where, you know, to all of our listeners out there, we're not going to just talk weddings all the time. We're going to talk about business and and make sure that you, you understand the, the basics and the foundation of what you need to own and operate a successful wedding venue. And and dude, that was just. Well, and Tim, Tim, to your point, you know, I, I really think this is something that I really appreciate about you. You have a very pragmatic approach to business, not just weddings. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people in the industry, it comes, whatever they, their part of a wedding is comes out of their passion and maybe comes out of a hobby, right? They're excited about photography they're excited about design. They're excited about florals. They've done a couple of floral arrangements. They planned a wedding. They really enjoyed it. And, and then they're like, let's take this hobby and let's make it a profession yep. or let's make it a side hustle. And it's so easy when you're doing that to say, well, you know, I'm passionate about it. I don't really want to think about it too hard. And you don't really run the numbers and you don't really do some of those things. And I'm constantly reminded when I'm talking with you, you know, you do have a very pragmatic, very, um, research and data driven approach to how you think about this industry. And I think that is absolutely essential for success, long-term success. You can't just treat it like a hobby. You know, you can't just treat it like something that you casually do randomly on weekends, unless that's really what you want. You know, if you're looking to make this a profession, you've got to focus on the numbers and, and what actually makes sense as a business owner and you as a business owner, are you even putting back into yourself? Are you getting the coaching you need? Are you, you know, investing in yourself to make sure you're a, a good business owner? So yeah, anyway, just, just wanted to. No, and that's, even if you do there. want it to just be a hobby, you still have to know the numbers because you don't want your, your hobby to be costing you money um, on the back end. So there's, no matter what, there's some sort of business component to everything that you're doing. If, if you think about it, the numbers, the numbers are the business. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to switch it up one more time because I really liked what this was going to, but what is one thing that inspires you? Me personally, uh, or, or from, or has inspired you to do what you do? Like what's, what's been one of the biggest sources of inspiration for you? I think freedom. And that's going to be a weird answer, but very American. I like it. (laughs) Hey, you're wearing like a red, white, and blue shirt. Uh, you know, every day, red, white, and blue. There you and go. Red hair, um, blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so where were we? Uh, ah, yes. So freedom. I, for me, it's, um, I think we get into business. We become entrepreneurs because, you know, initially we just don't want someone telling us to do what to do, right? And yeah, that's absolutely. kind of like, I think an immature 
the immature sprout of a really healthy plant, right? Yeah. And, and that plant is, you know, we want control over our schedule. We want the ability to have freedom to make more money and to have the autonomy over our schedule and our finances. And, you know, when you're an employee, you definitely have a range of um, where your salary can grow, how you can build in extra revenue, creating opportunities for yourself. But when you're a business owner, all the reins are in your hands. And yeah. if you are consistently willing to over deliver, that can have incredible payback for you that, you know, you have that runway that you just don't have as an employee. So starting off something that inspires me, something that is driven this is wanting that freedom and wanting to create, um, create a life that is not driven based on cost. And yeah. I really, 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 I love experiences. I love the customer service. I love, you know, the value of the interaction and you don't have to make decisions based on how much everything costs. I think that you live a much freer life and you're ultimately able to serve other people yeah. more. So that's, that's something that has really been a, a North star for me as I've thought about business. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to piggyback just a little bit on that because yeah. you said it's kind of an immature, you know, thought process at the beginning, but to be totally honest, like the less that we have to worry about our cost of living, the more freedom we have to go out and help others or improve the lives of other people. And I think that's where, um, you know, being able to control that component by being a small business owner, uh, really allows you that flexibility to go out and serve your clients better, serve your employees and your, your compatriots and all those people better. Um, so I, I really like that. Um, well, and we should, we'll totally have to do a different episode on this, but I feel like small business owners, you know, making up such, such a substantial point of, um, such a substantial part rather of, of even just GDP here in the U S but certainly kind of of business as a whole. I think b small business owners, us as small business owners often don't pay enough attention to our processes and systems to enable us to actually get outside of running the business on a daily basis. It feels selfish to, you know, get yourself out of the business. It feels like you're just trying to take more vacations when in fact, that's not it. It needs to be a fundamental shift in perspective on how you are related to your business. And I think the people who are able to make that shift are the ones who are actually able to really stay in business long term. And so I, I, in another episode, we're definitely going to have to chat about that because yeah. that's, that's the other thing that I definitely have seen in my own life as a struggle. And I've definitely seen other small businesses breaking out of that habit of thinking about yourself as the epicenter and the core of your business rather than a system or a brand or an identity that you're creating and kind of helping coach through the process yeah. of, of its life cycle. So, yeah, no, that's awesome. That's going to be a fun episode for sure. So I'm looking Absolutely. forward to that one. Um, last question. What's, what's one lesson that you can share? Um, to, one tip, one trick, one, something we can do to help our, our listeners out there. A tip for listeners. Um, we've been given a lot of them out there so far, but like, what's your, <laughs> can you pick one, your yeah. favorite? Yeah. Um, is this specifically related to venues? Actually, I've got it. So one of the biggest things that I would recommend, the biggest thing I would recommend is don't get so caught up. And this really piggybacks just on what I was saying. Don't get so caught up in running your business that you forget to invest back into yourself. And I'm not talking about spa days. I'm not talking about, um, you know, vacations, fun times with the family, pool days, snow day, whatever, right? I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about is picking up books, you know, you know, maybe not, maybe not courses specifically. I love books because for $16 or for yeah. $20 or for $6, right? You can listen to something on tape, on tape dating myself here. Uh, my cassette player right over here. Yeah. I my cassette it. player. <laughs> Where's my Casio at? Um, you know, you can listen to something on audiobook. You can read a book. You can go through, underline it, highlight it, and you can take lessons that other people have learned. And by doing that, you get outside of your perspective, your kind of daily grind, the reality of what you've created for yourself and understand there is something outside of that for you. Uh, and it's a fundamental perspective shift. We're so granular as humans. We're so, you know, um, 
I think focused on directly what's in front of us. And especially in the wedding industry, when you're just focused on the 12 or 15 clients you're serving or the 50 clients you're serving, it's so hard to understand that there's so much happening outside of you by giving yourself the freedom to explore some of that and gain some perspective through investing in your life, YouTube videos, even just exploring things in different industries and constantly being curious, I think radically changes the mental discussions that you have with yourself and gives your business creativity and a lot of runway to continue growing rather than if you're just focused on the day-to-day activities that you kind of have to do to keep it running. And I know for business owners out there that are hearing this, that are like, oh my gosh, I have so much on my plate already. And this guy's telling me to read books. I barely have time to go to the bathroom, right? I have kids. I have all this different stuff going on. Look, I have four kids, Tim, you have children. Um, you, you have to force yourself to take that time and realize that by investing in yourself, you're really ultimately investing not only in your children, in your business, in the people that you're serving, but it has a long range impact um, on on you as a person who's then able to impact everyone else. So that would be that would be my tip for any listener out there. Just a broad brushstroke type yeah. of tip. Um, and yeah, you'll have to hit us back and <laughs> let, no, that was that was awesome. Um, let us know and- how it works. Dude, it is one of the things that's most taken for granted. And like you said, if you're the epicenter of your business, but you are so restricted in your expansion and you're you're able to serve yourself, like everybody needs rest and that's your spa day. But like educating and learning and, and getting more creative, like that's just going to make your business better. So mm-hmm. if you're improving yourself, your business is going to get better. And yeah, that was beautiful. Well done. Well said. Yeah. I, I well, really and I, you know, I want to add one thing. You can rewire how you rest. Yeah. Because some people yeah. rest, um, you know, I've, I've certainly been here before. I'm going to rest and I'm just going to pound a bunch of bourbon with buddies and we're going to go play pool. You know, this is of course pre COVID (laughs) and, (laughs) and, you know, we're going to, you know, you know, do that, have a great experience, watch the game, you know, do whatever we're going to do. You know, any of the ladies out there listening, you know, you're doing things that maybe you feel like rejuvenate you, but they have a hangover component to it. Not, and I'm not yeah. talking about an alcohol hangover component, right. but you're exhausted. You stayed up till 2 a.m. And maybe your guilty pleasure is just having long conversations, phone conversations with your girlfriend across you know, the, the country or whatever. But yeah. that has this trickle-down effect to making you exhausted in the morning. You're not motivated. So really looking at the full cost of an experience and then understanding how can I, how can I, how can I rest? How can I take that break without having a long-term cost associated with that, that really is going to chip into my effectiveness as a business leader. No, that's, that's, that's going to be a huge episode right there. And we talk about the different ways you can rest and, and expand yourself because everybody said, you know, I need a vacation for my vacation. Like I, I just need yeah. to, you know, reset. And, it's like, and that happens it's and you spend a thousand dollars and you go to, you know, yep. Hawaii or wherever you go and you burn through this money and you're just pooped at the end. Yeah. You're just, you don't, yeah. So, and anyone out there with kids, you know, like a vacation, <laughs> if you're going on a vacation with kids, it's more of like a stressful field trip sort of yeah. scenario, yeah. you know, expensive, stressful, exhausting field trip. Yeah, exactly. Very well done. All right. Well, um, thank you, Jonathan, for letting me grill you today and, and, and the feedback and pricing. And hopefully that was very beneficial for our listeners out there. Um, I'm going to let you close it out, Jonathan. You're, you're the professional when it comes to this. So well, Tim, mind. thank you. I so appreciate I've appreciated this. I've appreciated getting to know you. Um, and starting this podcast has been a blast. We're following yeah. through on it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I think we both love starting, starting new things, but, um, this is something that is, I hope brings so much value to our listeners out there. And if, if you are listening, it would mean the world to Tim and I, if you subscribed to this channel, wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's on Spotify, Apple podcasts. Um, if you're, you know, one of the 2% of people that listen on Stitcher or somewhere else, (laughs) you know, if you're, Hey, if you're listening on Stitcher right now, send us an email at the venue rx at gmail.com because we're going to shout you out. I don't know how many people actually do listen from Stitcher, but I'm, I just want to say that because it could be it could be hilarious. We're going to have like 30 people and they're going to all email yeah. in. Uh, but, but yeah, please, please subscribe. It would mean the world to us as we're growing this community. Our, our vision is to really provide a lot of value to make your wedding business more fun, more profitable. And, uh, and, and so Tim and I really have that, that vision and that goal here with this podcast. So 
please consider subscribing. Check us out on YouTube again so you can see Tim's handsome face. You can't oh see God. his his tall, muscular 6'8 frame, but, uh, nope. you know. Not today. Not today. No, no, no. That's for a different episode. But <laughs> all right, you guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We will see you in the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Make sure to subscribe and follow along wherever you listen to podcasts as we delve into the wild world of weddings. 